Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. A bit later in the hour, we're going to talk about the worldwide increase in C-sections. And if you have a story you'd like to share with us about your C-section or your partner's C-section, why you had it, how did it go, what was it like, please share it with us. Give us a call, 844-724-8255, or you can tweet us at SciFry. Phone, 844-724-8255, or tweet at SciFry. But first, last week's report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change gave us a sobering look at what a world warmed by 2 degrees Celsius might look like. Then on the heels of that report, ExxonMobil announced that it was throwing financial support behind a U.S. carbon tax. It's a big step for one of the world's largest oil companies, which last year was sued by its own employees for misleading statements about the environmental and financial impact of fossil fuels and has a history of denying the climate science is settled. Here with the story, as well as other short subjects in science, is Omer Irfan. He's staff writer for Vox. Omer, welcome back to Science Friday. Thanks for having me again. So Exxon says it's going to back a U.S. carbon tax. On the surface, that sounds like a good thing. But what exactly are they proposing? They're proposing to back a lobbying effort launched by conservative former secretaries of state George Shultz and James Baker. This is a group called the Climate Leadership Council, and it proposes starting with a $40 per ton price on carbon dioxide emissions, and that price would rise over time. Then they would use that money to go back to people like you and me, essentially, in the form of a dividend or a rebate, and the estimate is it would start at about $2,000 a year for a family of four. There is a catch, though, and Exxon wants uh, rollbacks of other environmental regulations. And one big catch is that they want immunity from climate change-related lawsuits that want damages for these companies. It's the same deal that the, the gun producers have. Yeah, pretty much. It's kind of analogous to what they got, and it's what um, other industries have also tried to get. Hmm. Uh, Exxon has a complicated relationship with climate change. It's, it's been ahead of the industry in acknowledging it's a problem. They've had researchers who helped author the IPCC report, and yet uh, they are also being sued for misleading people about the impacts of fossil fuels. Years ago, in, in 2000, they took out ads in newspapers saying that the science was not settled. I mean, should we be taking this seriously, or is it just another you know, make us look good sort of thing. That's always the question, isn't it? I mean, the thing to remember about Exxon is that they are an investor-owned company, so they do have to answer to their shareholders. And they've been getting a lot of pressure in shareholder meetings to better address climate change. Also, climate change poses a business risk for them um, in terms of their facilities. And if they aren't out ahead on this, they might get slapped with a carbon policy that they don't like that doesn't actually work in their favor. And another way a carbon tax might actually benefit them is that it would target the dirtier fuels first, things like coal, which would clear some space for one of Exxon's other products, natural gas. And, of course, the uh, catches, the things they want in exchange for getting the other environmental regulations rolled back and the immunity from lawsuits. I mean, those are all things that benefit the company. So yeah. this could be viewed as an act of self-interest overall. Yeah, we're going to have to look deeper into this as in, in the weeks to come. Let's move on to, speaking of a warming planet, there are a couple of new studies this week that show massive losses of wildlife that has scientists worried. Tell us about that. Yeah, there are a couple different studies that kind of have a grim outlook for what humanity is doing to nature. One of them looked at arthropods in Puerto Rico, which includes, you know, insects, centipedes and spiders, creatures like that. They're critical to ecosystems because they perform functions like pollinating plants and they're also crucial food. So they're at the bottom of the food pyramid, so to speak. But the forest ecosystems have been changing faster than the rest of the planet. You know, the planet has warmed one degree since pre-industrial times. Forests have warmed on average by two degrees. And that's had a pretty consequential effect. Um, And so in the first study, the researchers, they did sort of a population census of arthropods in Puerto Rico. And with one method, using nets, they found an eightfold decline. And then using their sticky traps, which is another method of counting insects, they found an upward of 60-fold decrease in these invertebrates. Um, Now, this doesn't spell extinction per se, but it does show that there's been a drastic, drastic decline. And scientists have called this, you know, one of the most disturbing Mm. articles they've ever read. The uh, other big uh, study that also came out looked at mammals. 
specifically mammals that have gone extinct due to human activity. Um, since humans have started walking the earth, we've seen more than 300 mammal species disappear. But what's unique about this study is they tried to quantify how unique these animals were, not just the numbers, but like how irreplaceable they are. So as human, as mammals share a common ancestor, they branched out on the tree of life, and it turns out humans have been severing entire limbs off of the tree. And in aggregate, we've cost nature about 2.5 billion years worth of genetic, phylogenetic diversity, as they call it. Can you give me an example of one of those branches that was severed? Sure. Um, Ed Young, writing in The Atlantic, he gave the example of the pygmy sloth, which is a tr threatened species. Uh, it branched off from its common ancestor about 9,000 years ago, which makes it a very young uh, species and so a kind of a small twig on the tree. But then there are animals like the aardvark, which is the last survivor in its group, and it branched off 75 million years ago. So that means that if we were to lose those animals, that's a mm. thing that would take you know millions of years to regenerate in terms of diversity. Yeah, I get it. Uh, let's move on. There's there's an ongoing outbreak of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We, put, we reported on that back in August when it first began. So give us an update on what the status is now. Well, the outbreak is still outgoing. There have been 223 cases and 144 deaths, according to the World Health Organization's latest report. Uh, they met this week to determine whether or not this counts as a global health emergency. This is a declaration that would mobilize you know, more international resources, but it also has sort of trade-offs because company or countries will respond to that by imposing travel restrictions and quarantines, which can make it harder to get supplies in. So health officials have to be kind of careful about making these kinds of declarations, and they declined to make it a global health emergency. They made it a regional hmm. emergency. And what's scary and just kind of unnerving about this outbreak is that it's occurring in an active war zone. Oh, that makes it tougher to get in there and do something about it. Yeah, that's right. Is this there is, any reason for hope then? Yeah, this is actually one of the first uh, live trials of a vaccine. We now have an effective Ebola vaccine, but of course, the ongoing conflict in the uh, North Kivu region of the Democratic Republic of the Congo makes it harder to get health workers in. The health workers have been attacked in the past, and then they've had to been es be escorted by armed personnel, which in turn breeds distrust among the locals. And there's you know a limitation to how many resources that are going in. And so rather than using a blanket vaccination strategy, they're doing what's called ring vaccination where they track infected individuals and then try to vaccinate everybody around them, the caretakers and family members, to help sort of contain the virus in a more efficient way. Great stuff, Omer. Thanks for taking time to be with us today. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Omer Irfan is a staff reporter for Vox. Now it's time to check in on the state of science. This is KERU for WWNO, St. Louis Public Radio, KKD Iowa News. Public Radio News. Local stories of national significance. One year after Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico is struggling to rebuild itself in nearly every way, including its small farming sector. Reporter Bobby Bascom traveled to Puerto Rico nine months after the hurricane struck to see how farmers were recovering after the storm made working the land all but impossible. And she joins us with that story now. Bobby Bascom is a managing producer and reporter with Living on Earth. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thank you. You're welcome. So what is the local farming community like in Puerto Rico? How did Hurricane Maria affect it? Well, you know, before the hurricane, roughly 85% of the food in Puerto Rico had to be imported, and that, of course, made it really expensive, about 20% more expensive than um, here in the U.S. And after the storm, that number shot up to about 95% imported food. And the crops that they do grow, um, the, the things that were most heavily damaged were things that made a good target for wind, you know, so trees, things like uh, coffee, mango, oranges, that sort of thing, um, crops that could hide under so potatoes and carrots, they did fairly well. But then you had the um, collapse of the infrastructure there. So there were months and months without running water or electricity. I went up to a farm in the mountains where the roads were literally impassable for two months. So people had to have supplies airlifted in by helicopter. Um, one of the people that I met there was a small-scale farmer named Domingo Romano. 90% of our farm was destroyed, but it was really like 100% because with the hurricane, no one could come here to harvest. Wow, so where do we stand now after that? Well, now, I mean, they're trying to recover, but, uh, you know, infamously, FEMA and the government were slow to respond, so really volunteers sort of uh, stepped in to fill in the gap. 
when I was there, there was a group of volunteers from an organization called El Departamento del Comida, that's the food department, and they organized volunteers to, um, they sent a group of volunteers, anywhere from, you know, half a dozen to 20 people, will just descend on a farm for a week, and they'll tent out, you know, they'll camp out in tents, and they'll do anything the farmers need done. They'll uh, fix fences, plant crops, weed, fix the roof, and um, it's that sort of uh, physical support that helps get a farm back up and running, but the emotional support, I think, too, is really uh, crucial to people. Um, you know, I did a, a five-part series on recovery uh, on the island after the hurricane, and I saw this over and over again. You know, the government didn't respond, so people, just, you know, neighbors and volunteers, um, you know, turned to each other for help, and um, I think you're going to see more of that in the future. Mm-hmm. Why aren't there more local farmers in Puerto Rico? that might help have a large local food source if this type of disaster were to happen again? Yeah, good question. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a tropical island, plenty of sunshine and rain. It, it didn't make any sense to me to begin with either. But uh, you could really trace it back to uh, U.S. policies, um, specifically Operation Bootstrap was initiated in the 1940s. And it was a series of tax incentives and access to U.S. markets and things like that that discouraged uh, domestic agriculture in favor of tourism and industrial agriculture, so growing things like um, coffee and sugarcane that can be exported for profit. Um, you know, and that's fine mm-hmm. and dandy, but people can't eat sugarcane and coffee for dinner. Uh, you do see some small um, farmers markets and things like that. So they do exist, but it's really a niche market right now. Yeah, I guess a little bit of a law change could change all of that. Yeah. It could. If they had a mind yeah, to. <laughs> if they had a mind to, exactly. But um, I think that people do uh, understand, um, you know, that they need more of that. You know, for months after the storm, people were skipping meals yeah. and eating out of a tin can just to yeah. get by. So yeah. they're certainly acutely aware of how vulnerable the food system is there, and I think um, eager to do something. Bobby, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Bobby Bascom, managing producer and reporter with Living on Earth. We're going to take a break and then look at the rising rate of sea sections worldwide and here at home. What are the causes in the jump in the procedure? Did you have one? Why did you have it? What was your experience like? You can share it with us on our phone number, 844-724-8255. We'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. For anyone having a baby, the decision to have a C-section is not unusual. But what is unusual is the number of C-sections happening all over the world. Listen to this. The worldwide rate has nearly doubled from 12 to 21 percent in the past 15 years. And in the United States, one out of three births is by C-section now. A series of studies in the journal The Lancet looked at this trend to see what is behind this uptick, what are the effects on mothers and babies, and what interventions can be done to decrease that number. And that's what we're going to be talking about, C-section rates globally, also what's happening here in the U.S. And my question for you listeners is, did you or your partner get a C-section? What factored into that decision? What was your experience like? You can phone it in or you can tweet us. Our phone number, 844-724-8255. You can tweet us at SciFry. Let me introduce my guest. Holly Kennedy is an author author on that uh, Lancet series. She's also a professor of midwife midwifery at the Yale School of Nursing. Thank you for joining us today, Holly Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, Tell us, the Lancet series looked at 169 countries, and overall there is a rising C-section rates. Can you give us some of the numbers of different regions? It must have varied around the world. Well, it does. And um, what we found was that over 60% of countries overuse C-sections and 25% underuse the the procedure. So there's a quite a disparity. And there are multiple reasons. Um, part of it has to do with um, the um, sort of sociocultural acceptance of surgery as a normative um, thing to do. Mm-hmm. Part of it has to do with um, insurance and um, access, and uh, and a large part of it has to do with um, women not being able to get a vaginal birth after they've had their first cesarean. So it's 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 complicated. We've seen the rise um, in uh, particularly in North America, Western Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. 
For example, in Latin America, it's gone from 32% to 44%. And um, it, it, there's a bit of a paradox when what we would call um, too much too soon and too little too late. So in the countries that overuse cesarean, they are probably intervening too much in low-risk women that really don't need the procedure. And in countries such as in Africa that um, don't have enough access probably are underusing it. But the World about, Health but, Organization well, suggests that 15% is about right. About right. So when you, you think about one in three women in the United States having um, a cesarean, we're way over. Well, let's talk about over. But you have, there's a statistic, for example, in Brazil, 90% of the women that go into a private hospital are getting C-sections. Are they, are they requesting that before they go in? What is the mechanism? What happens there? Well, I can't speak specifically to, you know, the the interaction, but but you're right. Women who are wealthier, who have insurance, are much more likely, the majority of them will have a C-section. And it's um, it's an accepted normative part of the culture in, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, there are big differences uh, within countries. In China, the rate ranges from, what, 4% to 62%, depending on the province? Exactly. And again, that has to do with access and uh, wealth, education. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, um, women that are have greater education are more likely to have a cesarean, and um, which is a, a bit of a paradox in itself because um, have, a cesarean is not a low-risk uh, surgery. It is, it's major surgery, and, and things uh, there are small but serious risks, uh, both with the immediate surgery and then later in terms of the scar and stillbirth and preterm birth later mm -hmm. with um, subsequent pregnancies. And it's one small part of the piece of, pu of the puzzle in the United States for our increasing maternal mortality rate. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the, in some places there's too much, in some places not enough. What are those not enough places? like and why? The not enough places are places that don't have access in particularly in Africa and and countries that have lower resources. So they just don't have the facilities to, to do a cesarean sometimes when a woman really needs it. And I, and I think it's important to, to state at the outside, there are women who and babies that, that it is a life-saving procedure, but it it's not one that should be done for the majority of mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on a little bit about uh, what's happening here in the U.S. and why C-sections are increasing here. Tony Golan is the vice chair of quality in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Welcome to Science Friday, Dr. Golan. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's, let's talk about this um, there's also this idea of, of planned C-sections, right? Do you, do, do you have to approach this? Do you have this? Have you seen this in your experience? It's quite interesting. I think there's a natural suspicion that this is a major contributor to the C-section epidemic in the, in the United States at this point. And while it's true that uh, families, women can request to have a delivery via cesarean, it turns out that that's not really the most significant driver. Um, in our experience at Beth Israel Deaconess, for example, which is a tertiary care institution, an academic hospital um, in the middle of Boston, uh, it really only contributes to about 1% uh, of our deliveries per year. So while some of this could be attributed to patient opinions or patient desires or their perceptions of what's safer, um, the truth is, is that I think that we as healthcare providers need to um, realize that we are probably the major, major contributors to the rise in cesarean delivery rate here in the U.S. When you say healthcare providers, you're talking about the doctors who actually are performing it? Yeah. Uh, so certainly the doctors, the obstetricians, um, they are the ones who make the recommendation for a cesarean. Um, at the end of the day, um, that's who's responsible. Um, it's a complex environment to practice obstetrics, so there are other things that put pressure possibly on obstetricians. Um, we have incomplete, somewhat inaccurate data about health of fetuses during labor that might contribute to our decision making. Um, the progress during labor in terms of the cervical dilation uh, is subjective, so that can contribute to some inaccuracy. 
there's other things that happen on our unit that might put pressure on us, other emergencies that might be happening on a labor and delivery unit that might put some pressure on mm-hmm. us to make quicker decisions to move toward delivery. But at, but at the end, it's really our decision um, as obstetricians to make that recommendation. And generally speaking, when we make a recommendation like that, um, patients and families do say yes. Um, and they ask questions, but they generally do say yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Holly, what's your reaction to this? Oh, I would completely agree with her. The the culture of the unit where a woman is giving birth is very instrumental. Um, there are a number of strategies we can do to promote a, a first-time mother having a vaginal birth. And But you have to have the staffing. You have to have the commitment to do the kind of care that's going to help her uh, and her physiology to, to best mm-hmm. achieve a vaginal birth. Mm-hmm. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to Northern Kentucky. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, Ira. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Go ahead. Um, so I actually had an emergency C-section at 31 weeks, um, and I was super thankful for that for that being available to me. Um, but when I got pregnant for a second time, I really wasn't given the option of having a vaginal birth after a C-section. Um, I kind of had to do all of that um, education investigation on my own. So I had to look at CDC websites. I had to look at rates and what were the risks for me and my baby and for future pregnancies. And um, it really was up to me. It wasn't um, my, my provider thought, they said, do you want to have a repeat? And at the time I was like, oh, sure, I'll have a repeat C-section. But I wasn't given the risks and benefits of both to be able to make a truly educated decision. Um, And so I think that um, I was able to, I actually had a planned C-section, a repeat, and then I changed my mind at 36 weeks and my provider was really awesome with that and I was able to have a VBAC, but I feel like Hmm. there wasn't a lot of information given to me by my provider. I really had to search it out. Okay. And a lot of the information was very emotional and it was really hard to find the facts. All right, about. Lauren. Let, let me get let me get a, a great great call. Let me get a, a reaction. Uh, a Tony, you know, I'm, truth be told, I'm a C-section, maybe, <laughs> and I'm one of three. Back in the day, everybody had to have one C-section after another, and Lauren was sort of saying, you know, I didn't know that maybe I didn't have to have that. Access to VBAC or vaginal birth after cesarean is going to be is one of the critical interventions that we all as a healthcare community are going to have to um, embrace and need to embrace in terms of lowering the overall cesarean delivery rate. It's really uh, a matter of exactly what the caller said, which is uh, grabbing hold of accurate information. Uh, we see that as our obligation as obstetricians and midwives to really spell out what the risks are. I think we tend to sometimes overemphasize the risk of VBAC. Um, the risk of VBAC is, can be something quite catastrophic, but it's rare. And the benefit of a VBAC is that for births that happen thereafter, it's highly more likely. So for, for example, if someone's going to have a third or a fourth baby, mm-hmm. it's highly more likely that that person would have a vaginal delivery if she's once had a VBAC. And that really is something that contributes to the overall lifelong health of a woman because the risk of a cesarean delivery um, is not only related to the hour or so or even the days or so that follow a first cesarean delivery, but it traces back and forward to the years that follow, sometimes in some cases decades that follow. Women who have had cesarean deliveries are just more likely to have repeat cesarean deliveries as your caller almost did, uh, increasing the risk of life-threatening complications. The other thing that's very interesting about VBAC is that in units, in hospital units, labor and delivery units, where VBAC is embraced, where vaginal birth is something that's valued, it turns out that the primary cesarean delivery rate, which has no direct relationship to VBAC, because these are women who are having their first baby, and by definition, VBACs are not your first baby, those units who have higher VBAC rates of even trying to have VBACs and supporting women and having VBACs have lower primary cesarean delivery rates. It really speaks to this idea of the culture of a unit um, and really valuing mm-hmm. the safety of a vaginal delivery. 
Uh, lots of lots of callers, 844-724-8255. Let me get to some of the tweets because we have never had so many tweets <laughs> before. Uh, let me choose out some interesting ones. Uh, uh, Colleen writes, I had three cesareans, all my three kids. The first was an emergency one, but my concern now are that my children did not receive the bacteria from the birth canal. And I'm seeing possibly weak microbiomes affecting their digestive health. Uh, Holly, Tony, what do you think about that? You know, as Tony was uh, talking about the culture of the unit and VBAC, I think the the additional things that are, are really important for families to know when they're trying to make a decision is is the the value of a spontaneous labor. There's this neurophysiology that um, prepares the baby to be born. Actually. Um, contributes to health later in life uh, but that based on population based studies and the the travel of the baby through the that through the birth canal does seed the baby with microbiome so um, she's right that 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 does contribute to long term health i mean i um, it's it's a uh, been worked on. We've looked at different things to do to sort of do that with the baby after a C-section. But if you can do it just naturally, that that is better. The other thing is that babies born by C-section tend to have more respiratory um, distress, and particularly if they don't have spontaneous labor. So there's something about that spontaneous labor that contributes to the mm-hmm. neurophysiology and the health of the baby. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studio. Uh, so many questions. Let's go back to the phones to Wendy in Portland, Oregon. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Go ahead. So I'm I'm actually an obstetrician gynecologist, but I, I'm working just in a hospital. So I'm an obstetrical hospitalist. And one of the things that I do is uh, just stay in the hospital to manage labor patients. Um, so I think one of the ways the country is responding is that um, my type of job is becoming more and more popular so that um, there are just physicians that are managing labor and hopefully are allowing VBACs and allowing patients to labor as long as possibly safe. Um, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and we have the second highest rate of attempted out-of-hospital births, and we have really the best um, data from our birth certificates looking at transports back into the hospital. And I guess my, my concern is that when I hear... You know the um, when I hear people talking of the the you know very important things that result from from having labor, I have seen some attempts at labor that really should have never been there and have really resulted in some catastrophic outcomes for both mom and baby. So I I, I love vaginal deliveries. I think they're great, um, but I think there are some moms and some babies that need need C sections, and we need to support that mm-hmm. as well. And you know, really provide um, provide it when it's necessary. Tony Gullen, reaction. Thanks for that call. I. I- couldn't uh, agree more. Uh, cesarean delivery is a life-saving procedure, and there are certainly uh, many women who should not undergo a vaginal delivery. Uh, there's a number of different conditions that make that unsafe. The uh, the important thing, I think, um, to keep in mind is also that uh, regarding the example of home birth in the United States and sort of that being an extension of the health care system and promoting vaginal birth, um, while home birth in many countries uh, is a safe option and is a way to promote vaginal birth, we haven't quite figured that out in the United States. Uh, it is important in a healthcare system that promotes home birth to be able to make a really clear connection between home and hospital. And when st- certain thresholds are reached, then a patient needs to be moved from home to hospital. That's the part that we haven't quite figured out here yet. Um, and until we figure that out, I think it's it's gonna be challenging to really um, embrace that as an mm-hmm. option to promote vaginal birth. 
we can try to mimic that as best as we can um, in the hospital setting and certainly have patients stay at home um, for as long as is reasonable. Um, but home birth is not yet something in the United States that we have a really great system um, to support. Mm-hmm. All right, let me. right, we're going to have to take a break. Lots more questions. We're going to spend the, another good 10 minutes on this. So we're going to talk with Holly Kennedy and also Tony Golan. Our number, 844-724-8255. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. We've been talking this hour about the increase in the number of C-sections and what that means for women's health. My guests are Dr. Holly Kennedy, professor of midwifery at the Yale School of Nursing, Dr. Tony Golan, vice chair of quality in the Department of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the famous Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and uh, lots lots of folks on, on the line. Let's see. We only... Uh, Gosh, we can't get to everybody. Let me ask you, Holly, you, you worked on research midwifery in the U.K. How does the approach there compare to what we do here in the U.S.? Well, it, it, it uh, differs in several ways. And actually, when the Lan- this Lancet series on C-section came out, the w- World Health Organization also issued a new guideline to help help um, us look at decreasing cesareans. And, and one of the things that they have recommended is what the UK does, which is to have a collaborative midwife obstetrician model of care where the midwife does most of the primary care. And that's what happens in the UK. All women have a midwife. Wife, and some women have an obstetrician too when it's when it's really needed. And the Lancet also published a series on midwifery, a very extensive review of the evidence, and they found that midwifery was associated with improved outcomes, increase, including decreasing C-sections. And so, one what I'd like to just mention is in the United States, a study came out this earlier this year that mapped the integration of midwifery across each state to see how how friendly the state was in a regulation um, and reimbursement independent practice to midwifery practice. And so if you look at the at New Mexico, which has the lowest C-section rate of, of just about 18 percent, 26 percent of births are attended by midwives in that state. Hmm. Conversely, with New Jersey, has the highest rate of 33 percent, and only 7 percent of births are attended by midwives. And then they map that with outcomes. And uh, if you look at Alabama, Alabama has some of the worst maternal and infant outcomes in the country, and only 1 percent of births are attended by midwives. So that's not a causation. It is an association type study, but it is pause for thought. And that is what we saw mm-hmm. in the UK, is that um, when you have a model of care, when, when when women have access to continuity of care with their midwife, their midwife knows them, they feel respected, um, you have better outcomes. Uh, uh, Tony Golan, you worked to drive down, the rate down at your hospital at Yale, and after a decade, it went from 40 to 29% in a, in a decade. What did you do there? Well, first, we recognized that we had a problem, and I think that's step one in trying to solve it. And then we looked toward the evidence, um, not just our own evidence, but the national evidence about what was contributing to mostly in in terms of the indications for cesareans and focused very narrowly on primary cesarean. Um, First looked at the interpretation of how we monitor fetuses um, while women are in labor, that kind of monitoring called fetal heart rate monitoring is very tricky. It's quite inaccurate, and it predicts quite well for us when babies are well, but does not do a good job at telling us when babies are unwell. And nonetheless, obstetricians base decisions on this test. Um, I often say that in no other area in medicine would we make surgical decisions based on such a um, such a faulty test. Nonetheless, it's ubiquitous, and people use fetal heart rate monitoring. So we focused on really trying to focus on describing the fetal heart rate tracings using science and objective criteria rather than subjective mm. words. Um, we focused on our documentation, our communication. We also really tried to make sure that people were using scientific modern definitions for progress in labor. Uh, 
old definitions were assumed that women would move much faster in labor than newer, more modern data really proved to us. We wanted to make sure that people use modern definitions for what we thought was normal labor. As I mentioned earlier, we focused on improving access um, right. and, uh, and um, enthusiasm for BBAC and then also some other operations issues for our unit to change the culture of our unit. I misspoke. You were with uh, Beth Israel, and I said you were with Yale, where Holly is from, so I apologize now I'm here in Boston. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so does this all mean that, it, that uh, the, the hospital you go to determines more or less if you'll have a C-section or not? Unfortunately, it does. Uh, and so uh, one of the reasons why we know that we have room to improve on cesarean delivery rates is that if you look from one hospital to the next, even separated by one or two miles from one another, who take care of patients who have similar medical problems are of similar demographics, their cesarean delivery rates may vary by as much as 10%. This is unexplainable by any other reason other than the environment, the unit that you work in, the people that you work with, and the general enthusiasm for vaginal birth. Well, we have a tweet uh, that's relevant to this, and Sarah says, I have to wonder how much of the increase has to do with how much money insurance companies make on them versus a typical delivery. Did did you study that in your, your, your report, Holly? Well, uh, not specifically, except that it, it, the recommendation is that the financial strategies, women who are, have more money, who are wealthier, will have more C-section, so, which implies that um, they can get you know, reimbursed for that. Mm -hmm. And one of the recommendations that the series made was to not pay more for cesarean to really um, level that playing field. And in, and in addition to liability reform, um, many in studies that I've conducted, obstetricians have said to me, you know, I won't get sued if I do a C-section, but I'll, I can get sued if I don't do one in, in time or perceived to be in time. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Tony. The issue of reimbursement is is interesting here in the U.S., uh, where by and large physicians or obstetricians do not get uh, a vastly different amount of money for a vaginal delivery than a cesarean delivery. However, the hospital does. And that is something that I think isn't quite transparent for patients. Um, and probably reimbursement itself doesn't influence a lot of obstetrician decision making here in the U.S. Uh, the reimbursement is greater, but it really goes more toward the hospital side because of the length of mm -hmm. stay. Let's go to Sarah in uh, Somerville, Mass. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, I've had two C-sections, and I, um, they were at mandated by the doctor due to complications from Crohn's disease. And so I'm, I really appreciate this nuanced discussion, but I just wanted to give a perspective of how this is actually playing out um, among lay people and patients. And um, I think a lot of the talk about this has become very anti-woman. Um, when I told people that I was having a planned C-section due to my chronic illness complications, I had male friends saying things like, well, are you sure you don't want to just labor for a little bit? Maybe you could just ask if you could labor for a little bit. And I really interpreted that kind of as questioning, you know, can I be a woman if I don't, you know, push the baby out vaginally? And, and that was really upsetting to me because my two beautiful daughters wouldn't be here if the C-sections were not available to me. And, you know, I think, um, I just think it's really important hmm. for those at the academic and, and provider levels to understand that, that people are hearing these discussions and I think taking them in sort of inappropriate um, and different directions. So I'd, I'd love to hear the response All to right. that. I, I've got about a minute. Uh, Tony or Holly, which one? I would, I would completely agree with you that one of the most important things in this in this conversation is for the provider and the woman to talk through what is important to her and and so that she can make an informed decision about the best strategy for her so it, it is I would completely agree that it's important that uh, you have that conversation and and the risks and benefits of both vaginal birth and cesarean are fully mm. fully discussed and, and Tony what about this the, the charge of sexism here 
point well taken. I think, you know, any extreme is going to be dangerous. Uh, I think it is important to realize that regardless of how a baby is born, um, the person who gives birth to the baby becomes a parent uh, after that happens. Um, it's no less or no more, mm-hmm. regardless of what the mode of delivery is. And cesarean delivery um, certainly makes you just as much as a mother um, as having a vaginal delivery. Great way to end. Holly Kennedy, professor of midwifery at the Yale School of Nursing. Tony Golan, vice chair of quality in the uh, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Thank you both for taking time Thank to be you. with us today. You're welcome. Our science documentary podcast, Undiscovered, is back with its second season. And this week, the Undiscovered team investigates a cross-oceanic turtle feud. That's right, a turtle tiff over taxonomy. See what I did there? Here to tell the tale of the turtle is Ella Fetter, co-host of Undiscovered. And joining her this week is our sci-fi producer, Alexa Lim, who helped report this episode. Hi, both. Hey. Welcome to you both. Hey, Ira. Thanks for having us back. So, um, what's this turtle feud, <laughs> Alexa? I assume that the turtles aren't the ones that are feuding, right? I am happy to report that no turtles were harmed in the making of this episode. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, this No, no turtle battle, but the scientist, uh, it's a battle between scientists. And this story starts out with Travis Thomas. He's a PhD student at the University of Florida studying turtles. And he's studying a particular type of turtle called the alligator snapping turtle. Um, I, I don't know. Have you seen an alligator snapper, as they're called? No, I have not. Okay. Well, Ella and I went down to Florida to visit Travis, and we got to meet one of these turtles. And let me tell you, the best way to describe them is uh, scary. <laughs> and uh, these alligator snappers look more like dinosaurs than turtles. <laughs> they have these spiky shells and this beak that seems to stay open, ready to like maybe snap your tiny finger off. Or worse. Uh, or, or worse. And this is a clip from our meeting with Travis and one of those turtles. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa! Oh my god. Do they always just open their mouth like that? Usually uh, yeah. it's a defensive sort of mechanism. Don't Wait. panic if you just keep that firm grip. Oh my god. You sound you not panic. I'm fine. That w- yeah, it wasn't my proudest moment. <laughs> uh, that you did was, panic. I did panic a, a little. little. That was me, Ella. In my defense, this this turtle was very burly and frightening looking. Massive claws. We actually got a clip of, of the sound of the claws scratching the floor. Wow. Okay. And if that's not enough, Ira, this this is a oh, photo. Oh wow! It's, it's bigger than you are. That, <laughs> yeah, that that's not the one I picked up. <laughs> yeah, but no, no, it's, it's a, a huge, scary looking turtle. Right. What was Travis? Why was he studying these turtles? So, so this is where the feud part comes in in the turtle feud. Um, Travis and a few other scientists for years they were trying to show that alligator snapping turtles were not just one species like we thought before, but a few separate species that we'd lumped together. And just when they're ready to publish in 2013, uh, just they're, when they're about to announce these new species, they find out they've been scooped, that someone else has beat them to the uh, punch. Uh, I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Just as we were getting to the good part, I had <laughs> interrupt you see, Ella with Ella here with Ella and Alexa. Uh, now, okay, so see, being scooped, that sounds like a tough break. It is a tough break. And that in itself would not be a story. This is something that mm-hmm. happens all the time unfortunately, to Mm -hmm. scientists and to journalists. But this was a little weirder. Uh, The paper that scooped them, it it didn't have a method section or results section, the kind of thing you usually see in a science paper, which meant it didn't describe any new scientific evidence. And midway through this paper, it hits a pause on the whole turtle question and turns its attention to local politics in Australia, which is... Yeah, not what you normally see in a taxonomy paper. Um, so Travis takes a look at who, who wrote this very odd paper, and it's somebody that he's never heard of. His name is Raymond Hoser. Right. And Travis may not have heard of Raymond Hoser, but other herpetologists, who are people who study reptiles and amphibians, they definitely know who Raymond Hoser is, because he has a bit of a reputation. He calls himself the Snake Man. That's a nickname he's given to himself, and he's actually trademarked it. So, you know, that's his... Don't be careful. Yeah. Yeah. And he's got a big personality. This is a clip from his YouTube channel. Snake man here with my favorite steak. It is a death adder, of course. I pick a snake up in my hand. Sorry about that. And I kiss it. Watch. 
Moral of the story is, if you're nice to your snakes, they probably won't bite. Let's try it again. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the snake man, Raymond yeah. Hoser, and he's published hundreds of papers naming over a thousand types of animals, lizards, snakes, the occasional turtle. Um, but a lot of scientists say he's churning out a lot of quantity, but not so much quality, mm. so that he's flooding their field with these animal names based kind of on slippery, like sloppy science. So how's he able to name a species without good science backing it up, Ella? Yeah, so this was surprising. Uh, it turns out that in zoology, they have this big rule book for naming animals. But the main rule is you pretty much have to yell dibs. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you've got any science to, to back up your new animal declaration. You just need to publish first. You can even self-publish if you want. And so that's kind of what this episode is about, in part, is how scientists got into this mess. And it's also, of course, about what happens with Travis and mm. the Snake Man. We we went looking for the Snake Man, yeah. and the, you know the story got more complicated than we yeah. first thought it would be. And that makes it good story. It's a real story. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I went back and forth on. Anyway, we'll you, find out. You're in season two of this. Is, was this the scariest? <laughs> episode you've had, do you think? Uh, was it the scariest? We do have some life and death. Uh, yeah. But the, the stakes were not quite as high as in some other episodes, but we definitely got... We, we The reports where we were very nervous. Feuding about turtles is wow. serious business. All right. Ella, Ella Fetter uh, co-host and produce the Undiscovered podcast along with uh, Annie Minoff. And Lex Lim is a Science Friday producer. Thank you both for taking time to be with us today. And uh, if you want to listen to the latest episode and all the rest of them, they are on our website, undiscoveredpodcast.org. Undiscoveredpodcast.org or wherever you get your, your podcast. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank One last thing before we go. Microsoft co-founder and billionaire philanthropist Paul Allen passed away this week and in 2004 he told us how he decides to spend his wealth. Yeah, I guess it's pretty obvious that that science and and space exploration and technology in general are, are really in my blood and I just try to I just try to find things that uh, that either need to be done should be done or where I can make a difference. Uh, um, in a significant way. And, and those and, and the things I've been able to participate in have been very, very, very exciting. Paul Allen leaving us this week at the age of 65. Charles Berquist is our director, our senior producer, Christopher Intagliata. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, and Katie Haller. We had technical and engineering help today from Sarah Fishman, and we're welcoming Kevin Wolf on to the technical staff for our first time. And, of course, we are active all week on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the social media. You have a smart speaker? Yeah, you can ask it now to play Science Friday whenever you want. So every day now is Science Friday, and you can email us. Our address is scifry at sciencefriday.com. And when you go to our website at sciencefriday.com, we've got all kinds of great educational material up there, all kinds of videos and great stuff uh, for teachers.